Okay, so welcome back and let us go ahead and get going with session 11 of 120C, 220C. Today we're going to continue thinking about the sun and really try to be a little more sophisticated about how we analyze its position and the effect of the sun on ice structures. Where we're going to move beyond just kind of thinking about things in terms of simple vectors and geometric positioning to actually starting to think about really how the sky conditions affect the amount of solar insulation, the time of day, the time of year, you know, the weather patterns, your local conditions, all those things are a factor into really getting better values for like uh, what the true insulation is going to be and how we can use those to go through and evaluate structures and ultimately figure out like what we want the design to be. So we're going to uh, do one last thing with some vectors, but then move into using something called the solar analysis node. So there's a solar analysis for Dynamo node that actually uses just kind of a back-end service that Autodesk hosts that um, you've seen in a lot of different cases. You know, you've seen it within Revit. We've seen it oh, with Informa. There's a lot of different places where it exists, but it basically uses that same analysis engine to basically feed geometry oh, yeah. through but and ultimately gather yeah, some values. <laughs> so as we get started, we are going to go through and start with uh, updating some software because this stuff is so fresh, it, like, uh, it's brand new, and you need to get the latest version so that it all works right. And what we'll do is go ahead and log in, and we're going to have you do two things to get started. One is first update to Dynamo 1.0, which was just released, and also update the solar analysis package, so you're kind of getting the latest one that's available up there on the server. Because the old ones don't work anymore, really? which is, of course, oh. rough. So here's what we're going to do. If you go on in to our school start or by going into Revit and kind of updating some of these things, and please do this on your machine, then watch out if you come in and work on a different machine in here, because we'll have to do it to all the different machines to get them all up to speed. But basically, what we're going to do is go over to Revit and do a couple different things. If you open Dynamo, it's like I already updated just right before class. You can sort of see I have Dynamo 1.0 here, but what happens when you open Dynamo on your machine? You'll probably see up in the corner, right up in here, a little green kind of cloud thing that somehow looks like it has an arrow pointing down and it wants to download something. Let's see if you can see that. If not, we're just going to have you just download it from uh, the web directly because that's the other way to get to it. But if you open up Dynamo, you should see that little thing that indicates we need to go through and like uh, download it. Let's see if you guys see it on your side. And if not, then I'm going to show you how you just download it directly from the web. There it is. See the little green cloud that has the uh, like down arrow? So oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and hit that. In Dynamo? Yeah. So one way is if you're in Dynamo, it's going to warn you. It's probably going to tell you that you may download or need to uninstall or close Revit so that it can do its installation. For people who don't see that and people who are watching at home who don't have it on their machine, let me just go to dynamobim.org, which is the other way to do this. Okay, if you need to go through and type in an administrative password, which you probably do in order to install it, go ahead and use the top secret password which most of you know is over here on the board on the side. That's the username, and let me go ahead and type in the password. It is just okay, which most people remember pretty well. So if you're installing here, please go on ahead. Let me go to uh, just show where you get it. If you are, are not working here, you can also say just download Dynamo here. Should be able to. It's waiting for dynamobim.org. You don't want to wait. Let me click on that one and see if it does any better. The server is being hit. I think it's just been updated, so 
probably a lot of action trying to get to it. On your side, like Jenna, it looked like you were typing the password. It's, it's installing for you? Yeah. Excellent. How about you now? Doing good yeah. there? Okay, great. Okay, so get yourself there. Again, if you're doing it that way, you don't need to do this again. If you went to dynamobim.org, just go on down to right here where it says download Dynamo version 1.00. There's actually two versions. There's the version that runs on top of Revit 3. There's the other version, which is licensed separately, okay, so that you can use it without having to use Revit. Okay, so we tend to keep on working with the one that works directly within Revit. I will warn you also, as we're looking at this scene, a new version of Rev has actually been uploaded. All of the all the other tools update every April. Um, so there's a 2017 version. I would advise you generally not to install it yet, because what will end up happening is oh, things that you open in the new version won't be backwards compatible on machines that don't have Revit 2017 installed. So since most of the machines here and up in Scythe have 2016, you're probably better just sort of staying on that. But what we usually do is wait till the summertime and just update it all at that time and get ready for the new year. So just watch out for Revit 2017. Yes? Uh, with Revit 2017, as a student, that's yes. about to not be a student anymore, can we download Revit 2017 like the last minute and still get three yes. years? Yes. Because that's the way to do it, is wait till. Practically, Practically. You, you can do it whenever, because your student account won't, won't, won't expire. Oh, okay. The terms of the licensing agreement oh, okay. say that you download it, you install it. You just can't use it professionally. Exactly. As soon as you start using it professionally, then you should think about getting a real license. Okay, well, then I'll probably have, I'll probably have one anyway. So. Yeah, but in the meantime, go through and yeah, download and install it. Do it yeah, you'll even be, you know, June 15th, you'll still have the ability to download it. Okay. That won't cut off. But, but in that case, once my Stanford password or password email gets cut off, which is pretty like soon. Six months. Six six months. Or 30, yeah. 30 Even days. then they roll you into like an alumni account where they, they forward your mail. Can but you, for the most you part, do that for a while. your autodesk good idea, will, idea will stay the same. Gotcha. It'll always forward. And you can probably change the, back, the, change the email that it sends to or add one. Exactly. All right. Yeah, Thinking ahead, so no, this is, uh, you're, you're thinking the right things. Okay, so uh, most of you have Dynamo 1.0 down? Very good, okay. Next thing that I want you to get down is a new version of the Solar Analysis plugin. And where you find that is under Packages. Actually, let's do this. Go to Packages, and um, if you say Manage Packages first, see if you see Solar Analysis for Dynamo in the list of packages. And it should be like the 0.9 version, something like that. If there is, what we want to do is uninstall that. I think if we come back over here, we say uninstall. We can uninstall that. But take out the 0.9 version. We're going to need to upload the 0.92 version, which of course seems silly since we just downloaded the 1.0 version of Dynamo, but they're off by about a week in terms of the version numbers. So knock out 0.9. I have here. Okay, but if you want to knock out point 0.9, what you do is choose. That's actually a menu. We'll say uninstall. And then we're going to install solar analysis point 0.92. So do you see solar analysis for Dynamo point 0.9 on your machine? No. Nope. How did you get into okay, so manage and then yeah, under packages, say manage packages. If you don't have 0.9, that's okay. If there's no solar analysis listed on your machine, super. We're just going to download and install the new one instead. Okay, so see if you get rid of the oldie. If it is there, knock it out. If it is not there or you're ready for the next step, just come on over and say under packages, we'll say search for a package. And Give that a minute to sync. It always takes longer to sync than I think it should. And then we'll type in solar and you'll sign, find solar analysis for Dynamo. I think the servers are being particularly fussy this morning just because Oh, a lot of people hit this. Okay, so I'm going to type in solar 
And what do I have in there? Solar analysis for Dynamo. You can see right here, actually, if I click on that, there's several different versions, and we're going to go for the 0.92 version. What happens is every oh, four or five months, the old version just times out and expires. They sort of have them set up so that they just expire on a specific date. So it looks like on the 25th of April, okay, the last one, or this new one got released. I suspect that on the 24th of April or somewhere right around there, the 0.9 stopped working. So how I noticed it this morning as I was going through and pre-flighting some of the examples that we used, like 0.9 just wasn't working. And it took a few minutes to sort of figure out, why does my old node, which used to work so well, doesn't work anymore? And it's just that uh, you know, the old node expired. So, especially when we start working with these analysis nodes that tie into different web services, kind of keep track of the versions, because if, if they just stop working for no apparent reason, chances are it's not you, it's something that changed on the back end. Okay, so. .92 installed. And what's it called? It's Solar Analysis for Dynamo. Okay. How did you get to the online site? What you do is under Packages, just say Search. Oh, the other one? What I did is I started by saying under Packages, I said Manage Packages and then found the old one and just uninstalled it. If you try to just install the new one, it'll actually say, ooh, okay, I'll install it, but it may require you to restart Revit to kind of go through the whole cycle of uninstalling and reinstalling. Let's see if you can get those in there. Okay, so let's see so let's see if we can get you all up to date on the software again watch out for the software as you go moving around from different machines most of you actually tend to sit at the same machines time to time <laughs> which is good because then you sort of have your own baby and you know that it's well taken care of and all up to date but if you go moving around from different machines you know i'll try to get through here probably tomorrow and get everything installed on all the machines Okay, enough of that. Let's go back over here. Y'all in pretty good shape in terms of installing in the background there? Not yes, quite. The is it, is it when you're installing packages, is it just still waiting for the server? What's it doing? It's just, it's like, package manager website install packages. That's kind of strange. Okay, hmm, well, let's go through and let's close that one up. And let's just go to search for the new package. Okay. Let that search for just a second. Right, sync up and then we'll try solar. Okay, you're looking good. I think I'm good. Okay. Let's see what's going on. second if it's telling him back yet in terms of what's going on. Okay, you're syncing there, looking there, you got most machines. Okay. We're going to start with something that isn't using that package yet, so if you don't have a download yet, we still have a chance to kind of catch up. Just as we get going, different things to be aware of. Assignment 4 is out there on like uh, the Canvas site. Please go ahead and take a look at that. Again, what you're going to be doing in that one is very related to what we're doing kind of in class in these next couple sessions. You're going to go through and just start with, oh, uh, let's pop back over here, some sort of parametric structure. It can be a new parametric structure, even working with the parametric structure you've already come up with. And you're basically going to look at the whole notion of uh, trying to compute and maximize the amount of sun that you are soaking up to the structure by sort of playing with the parameters. So here's some examples of just some panelized structures, kind of the parametric stadium or one that's more the concourse. And again, 
What you're going to do is start by just using the whole notion of directness. So the same sort of function that we've been using here in class is taking the vectors, remembering to check and flip the normals, just in case the normals happen to be flipping because of your math. Okay. And then providing some visual feedback. So you know, doing something with some colorization or adjusting the panel parameters. What you want to do also, though, is we're going to start thinking about this, evaluating the overall solar potential of your structure. Because what we're going to do is, you know, all the different panels have some amount of directness or have some amount of solar insulation on them. You just want to start thinking about some overall evaluation so you can start saying that one shape is better or worse than another shape. And whether you're going to think about just sort of summing up the cumulative insulation or average the cumulative insulation. Or, there's a lot of ways you can approach this about whether you kind of want high averages or high total amounts, depending on what your goals are. But you're going to come up with an overall directness score, for example, summing them or averaging, whichever you sort of like. For three units, we're going to use a solar analysis package, what we're going to do today. This is going to be very similar, although, as opposed to doing directness values by just uh, doing dot products, we're going to go through and compute solar insulation values okay, using uh, the, solar uh, the solar analysis package. Then the idea is we're going to try to go through and tweak the parameters to change the shape so that you maximize the amount of sun that you can get. Okay. So it's going to start with just sort of tweaking the input parameters on your own. If you have some different sliders to control the length or the peakiness or the number of waves, just go through and try to find those, set the input parameters to what you think of as being optimal values. Then basically you know, show us visually kind of like uh, what we think is uh, the best solution. For four units, what we'll do, and we're going to get to this state also, is we're going to say, great, OK, if we have the ability to tweak your structure and evaluate it, let's think about using something called a list map, which is really a looping structure, to vary a range of values. So just starting with input values, you know, whether it is the peakiness or the rotation or some value that we're going to change, just to go through a whole bunch of different um, variations, get that evaluation value, and then just really try to see if we can you know, given that range of input values, figure out where we have the, the optimal uh, inputs. Okay. So that's what's happening as we go on through. And we're going to do sort of the working with solar analysis and list mapping today. OK, so let's check in. Yes? One question I had about uh, the three units, step two, when we maximize, are we supposed to find the absolute, absolute max? No. By like ah. Doing it's Excel, like, you know how Excel has, like, the solve for... Oh, sure. No, if for this one, definitely it's more just kind of your gut level, based okay. on sort of tweaking where you think it is. What will happen is, and that's really the point of all of this, is that, you know, up to here, you'll get close to what you think it is. When we start doing list maps, then we can exhaustively go through a whole range of values and test them all. Got it, okay. Because it's always tricky as we're doing this to figure out, did you find really the absolute optimal values, or did you find the local optimal? And you have to be in a trough or at a little hill or something like that. So, and that's really where we're going in the course is really to think about evaluating different forms and structures and then trying to understand different ways we can navigate through all the input values. This map is an exhaustive way, which it's almost going to guarantee that you don't miss anything, but it's a very slow way of doing it because it evaluates everything. There's other structures that, you know, are a little bit better about like, um, kind of diving in, finding different values, and sort of spreading out to like a, you know, just might be a little bit quicker and more efficient about trying to find where those maximums or where those optimums are. OK, Dan, how'd, how'd you do on the install? Is the install working for you? Yeah, I installed, but I just don't have any other pages. OK, just that one. OK, well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, if you can, install Lunchbox, too. We're at Ellen Quads from Grids, you know, the Zach stuff. OK. If not, yeah, some of the other examples will break a little bit, but that's okay. We'll get to it. Okay, so if you have all that, let's go ahead and recap where we were. Last time we were looking at just really trying to go through and use this directness of orientation and like doing the dot products to go through and either map panel colors or change the panel parameters. And we even looked at how we could go through and use vectors for the sun's positions 
go through and follow the sun. So, you know, starting with just kind of converging, but then improving it by going through and just adding that sun vector so that all our different solar panels follow the sun and move through the sky. And uh, our solar form is getting sort of maximum efficiency. Okay, today what we're going to do is go through a couple different examples. The first one's going to be this notion of a window overhang, but we're going to use that same idea of the vector logic to go through and figure out how high or how far out the overhang should be on a specific window, or some sort of light shelf, just to go through and, in this case, we try to shield out all the sun, but again, we come up with different criteria and sort of change the way we try to like uh, just drive the design. So go ahead and if you can, open up example 11.1. .1. We're going to go through several different steps. Actually, let me just open it up first. Let's show you what it looks like. We'll just open 11.1. When this thing opens, you'll see that I have a very simple little structure here with some windows on the side, and the windows have this oh, kind of parametrically driven overhang. So you can think of it as an awning or a canopy or a light shelf or something like that. If I zoom in on there in my little house, you'll sort of see that here's this little window. And this window actually has some shelves to it. Okay. So this is sort of based on the notion that you have, oh, some sort of a dynamic structure that can be altered. So in this case, you know, we have some shelves that can be extended or kind of rolled back in. And a hard surface that's a little bit harder to do. They have a lot of different things where oh, different telescoping things pop out or pull back that you can go through and kind of think about some sort of an awning that would do something like this. But the idea is, in this scenario, we would like to go through and no matter where the sun is in the sky, you know, just basically block the sun. Okay. Now, that isn't necessarily what we want to do. There are a lot of times in a lot of climates where you'd actually like to get the sun in in certain times. You know, you'd like to go ahead and use the sun during the wintertime to heat things up, and you block it out in the summertime. But for any specific condition, we can go through and compute really what it is that needs to happen if we want to block that sun. And then I guess we would decide what we really want to do with that. But the idea here is, you can sort of see that even in the scenario that's illustrated right now, like uh, here's the sun, you can sort of see the shadows coming down from the sun. Right now the window lines, or the window kind of, uh, canopies right now, are blocking the sun, so no sun is actually getting inside the windows. Now if we change that around a little bit, for example, if I change that to, oh, just add, for example, let's change it to June. You'll see in June, the sun is up higher in the sky. So in June, we don't actually need the canopies to stick out as far. You know, we have a little excess shading right now. So those canopies could actually go back further. We don't need as much overhang during June because the sun's just up higher. So how I did that was just I have my little sun, my little heliod on here, and I just click on the date, and I just type in June or July. And you can see the sun sort of moves down in the sky a little bit. So in June, we tend to need less shade. If we wanted to keep all the sun out during December, though, you'll see the sun's very low in the sky. So we'd actually need a very long shade to go through and keep all that sun out. It probably would be more useful to go through and think about trying to you know, rotate or change the angle of the shade as opposed to trying to make it long. But again, as a design goal, we might actually want that sun because uh, it's going to help us heat up the building. So just it varies different times of the year. Okay, so the idea is if we want to be able to adapt to that, here's what we're going to do. If you could think about the basic geometry of what's going on here, let's go ahead and see if we can sort of figure this out. Basically, we have a window surface. Let me kind of zoom on in here. Okay, and the window surface is essentially kind of right about there. 
Okay. So what we're trying to do is we have these vectors coming down from the sun. Okay. They're coming down at this angle. If only I could draw a parallel, that would be good. <laughs> but I can't. So we have these coming down at this angle, and here's what we basically want to do. If we want to say that we want to block the sunshine, what we basically need to do is think about having some sort of a shade that pokes out far enough okay, that it basically you know, meets that same angle. And what we need to ultimately figure out is this relationship. Basically, what we need to do is figure out, oh, for this sun and the angle that the sun's coming down at, the relationship between the horizontal and the vertical, and then use the same relationship relative to what's going on here. So basically, what's going to happen is my red in relationship to my blue, so the length of the overhang versus the window height, okay, really wants to be the same as the relationship between the sun's z value and the sun's either x or y, depending on what you want to think about that as being. Okay, so what we're basically going to do is just use the whole notion that the sun has a vector and there's a relationship between the x and the y and the z in the sun vector and use that to go through and compute really what the shade distance should be and then we just want it to have the same relationship. So, you know, whatever my x is to my z, I want my window height to the overhang to be. Okay. Simple ratios. Okay, again, this is based on blocking but it just sort of demonstrates how vectors can be used. So let's think about that. How we are going to go through and approach this is as follows. We're going to start out by just basically, hey, setting up a window. We have a nice uh, parametric window object. And that parametric window object has a couple of different things. We have some parameters. We have the glazing height. We have the glazing width. We even have a little bit of a shade width. We can sort of think about whether the shade width is just the side, same as the glazing width, or we want to add a little overhang to the sides just so it kind of overhangs a few inches on either side. But we're going to do a lot of setting parameter by name. Okay, just choose some different values and make a little house in the windows that does that way. We also are going to go through and get the sun vector values. We have a sun settings and a sun direction. That gives us the vector. And then we're going to break it down into the x, y, z. So we can go ahead and take those components apart and just compute what the ratio is. Okay. Based on all that stuff, we're going to go through and compute some overhang values. In terms of computing the overhang values, let's think about this. If we want to go through and completely shade the uh, window, what we're going to do is take the y, sun's y versus z, and multiply it by the height of the window. I add a little bit more to it just so we have a little overhang at the bottom so that you don't uh, have any like, uh, light bleeding on through. But it's basically just taking y over z, and then this is basically, uh, that's the z, so we're going to figure out what the y would be. Okay. And then we'll do a slight variation. We'll say, hey, you know, since those shades can get really, really long, if they're greater than some maximum value, divided into two shades, or divided into three shades, or kind of number of things as opposed to that. So we'll look at dividing it into two. So we'll figure out how does it do compared to the maximum. If needed, we'll cut the depth in half and we'll actually split that evenly so the height is like evenly split from top to bottom. Okay, so that's the roadmap for this one. Let's go and take a look at it. So here we are, we're hanging out in Revit. Go ahead and close that on up. I'll just shift that back over this way a little bit more. And we'll start taking a look in Dynamo. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to just sort of pan that over so we kind of keep track of it over in the corner there. And we'll open up Dynamo and see how this works.
Okay, so I'll start by, let's just go ahead and go to 11.1. And, oh, we'll just set those window parameters. That's the easy part. Let's go through there and just kind of make that part happen. We'll start with 1A. We have this notion of the sun itself. That's just sun settings. Sun settings vector, sun direction gives us the vector. And then this block right here, sun vector dot x, sun vector dot y dot z, just breaks those into three different components. So if you want to just sort of see what that looks like, Let's go ahead and run that. You'll sort of see the sun direction. Here's the vector. It has these different x, y, and z components. The x is negative 7. So sun vector dot x just pulls off that component. Sun vector dot y dot z. So we're just trying to basically get at that, oh, I think it's the y versus z. Okay, and you can keep those two. Okay, now for the window itself, no worries. We have some uh, parametric window. That's going to be our element. I have some different sliders here for glazing height, glazing width, and the amount of overhang that's to the sides. So just different little values. And all of this does right in here is just sort of maps them together and applies it. So we can take that element. And if I want to do the g glazing height, GL height, I'll slide that one in. If I come on back and I say, oh, I have those same elements over here. I want to change the glazing width. Here's the width value. Now, it's always sort of interesting about this in terms of whether you want to sort of pass the element down or just pass them through and do it. You can think about it doing it serial or parallel. It doesn't really matter. I could take the element and pass that one down if I like. It really works either way. For the shading width, oh, let's go ahead and I'll just pass that one through over here. Shading width, and what I'm going to do is just basically take the glazing width and add to it some little bit of overhang. So if the glazing width is like four right now, let's just try it. I'll make those some nice even numbers so they look a little bit better. I'll make that 10. I'll make the width four. So in terms of the shading width uh, overhang, what I'm going to do is just basically add a little bit more to it. So oh, if I want to add like another 0.2 to it or something like that. So the shade width will be 4.2 now. Let's go ahead and put the shading width, the glazing width. That should give us a 4.2 right now. And I'll pop that in as the shade width. Great. So, so far, nothing too awful special there. That is really just adjusting those. And you can try playing with that a little bit. You can try making the glazing width very skinny, like 0.1 or 1. You get these, should we get these nice, tall, skinny windows? And make it 2. Make the glazing height 0, 03 instead, kind of short windows, whatever's going on in there. Looks as, in, as I'm doing the glazing height, I didn't set the uh, uh, head height of the windows. I might want to do that too, just so they stay high as opposed to kind of moving on down. But we'll leave those there. Actually, if I want to do that, let's just do it real quick. Yeah. Rewind here. So these things also have, let's see if I find them. Interesting. The elevation. Let's try this. Hang on. Okay. This this one's set up in sort of a funny way. It says elevation as opposed to head height. No worries. If I want to go through and control those, it looks like like the the elevation is the lower part. So you can like go ahead and make that higher if you want to. There's a head height parameter also. Yeah. Where'd that go? Is it inside? It's inside. 
Now that's an interesting thing because I don't think of that as actually being a. I think I think that as being a good instance parameter. Yeah, but it says eight feet. That doesn't seem right. Doesn't look like it's being used. Yeah, let's go for elevation. Okay, so again, what I'll do is I'll just do a little set parameter by name. The parameter name is just going to be elevation. Again, spell it just right. Does it like it or does it not like it? See what I got. Looks good. Let's see if that's a special parameter, whether I can get to it or not. Okay, for the value, oh, I'll just go ahead and give that a value of like three. that works. Completed. What's going on here? Parameter string. Parameter string. What's going on there? Value element. Favorite element. Oh, I see it's going on. Actually, if I want to do that for all of them, I see what's going on. No, it's OK. A couple different things. These things, because I'm going directly from the family, if I say element set parameter by name, those are type parameters. If I go through and uh, try to set the instance parameters, what I basically need to do is go through and grab a slightly different way I can pull specific elements. That would be OK. The other thing I could do is if I want to grab them all and change all their instance parameters is this. I didn't mean to go down this is a rat hole, but let's see if we can figure this out. It would just basically be there's all elements of type. Let's see if I can find that. Where did I could find elements of type? Let's try all that. elements of type, yeah. Say again? It exists. What was it called again? All elements of type with spaces in between, and then it feeds in. Element type and out elements. Excellent. Need to keep that in there? Yeah. It's like the fifth down, sixth down. Oh, now it went away. There it is, right there. Excellent. Okay. So. What I can do is take in that type, and then it'll pass out the elements. Okay, now that should work. Let's see if that works. Let's well, see what's got on there now. Takes arguments of type, Revit types, family type. That should be okay. It says family type. Selection rabbit. Hmm. <laughs> I would think that would work, but if it's not going to work, I'm not going to worry about that because that's just going to take us down a rabbit hole. So I'm not sure why that function is not working because you would want that to return that. All elements in the active document of a given type, and it's they're definitely of a given type, so I'm not sure why that function is not working. You got it. Don't worry about the, this raffle, because it'll just uh, distract us. OK, so let's just do that manually for now. If I want to, I'll just grab them all. Select all instances. OK, just a level of them. 
I always hate it when notes break, because then you, you're tempted to want to go through and fix everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, again, it won't be all that relevant to what we're doing. I love this. I've got to figure out why that's breaking. I don't know why. Okay. In terms of once we've got all this stuff set up, we're actually in pretty good shape. We are ready now to start going through and doing a little calculation. And for the calculations we want to do, what we want to basically do is say, hey, we are going to calculate the shade over hand heated. And this is going to be sun y over sun z and multiply it by the glazing height. Added in for extra. So if you want to jump in and kind of just oh, have all those nodes in place, you can kind of connect them. Open up, oh, what is it? I think it is 2A. In 2A, the front part is all connected, but we'll just kind of connect the back part here. Here's what we're basically going to do. We have those sun XYZs. That's my window just a little bit too big. Okay. And what we're going to do is pull them on in here. So what we're going to say is we want to get the sun y and the sun z so we can sort of divide them together. So I can pull out the sun y. Pull out the sun z. Okay, divide those two things together. And then I'm going to multiply them by the glazing height, but I'm also going to add that little bit of a buffer to it. So in terms of the glazing height, it looks like it's currently over here. Okay. That last little buffer is really, again, it could be uh, just sort of a choice. Oh, we can go through and put that in as an input slider if we want to. You can put in sort of a specific value there. It's really just all about this notion of and we go through and just make sure that there isn't a little bit of overlap. So 0.25 of a foot, I believe it is. It's probably going to be safe. So it's going to go through and compute this value of 6.9. Okay. Now, this value of 6.9 is kind of A-OK. -okay. We can go through and set the parameters. So we can set the shade depth to be 6.9. If you want to do that, what we really have to do is see if I have the load even kind of hanging around here. I think it is. If not, we'll put it in there. Nope. Okay. If we wanted to come back over here, hand that over a little bit. And we will take a look at what the parameter is. This is break, right? Like right around the sunset, though, because it goes negative. Say it? Again? Will this break? So if it goes, if it goes, if the y vector goes positive, like sunrise or sunset. Oh, that it probably would. It Let's would just give us a negative number. We'll try that. We should put some uh, bounding on it to make sure that it never gets worse than that. So what do I have here? I have this notion of, oh, these different things. Head height, shade extension. It looks like shade ext is the variable that I'm going to be playing with, shade ext. Okay. So if I want to go through and, for example, set that value, what I'll do is say element, set parameter by name. It's hanging around down here. So the 
code block is going to be shade x for the name. Okay, in terms of, now this is again a uh, type parameter, so I'm just going to pass the type in. And then I can go through and just take that value. Let's try running this and see what they look like. <laughs> Let me turn this off for just a second. I'll auto hide that. Too awfully bad there. It's changing them all right now, but let's go ahead and keep on playing. So the question Jordan had is, and I think it's a good one, let's just try it. So around sunset, you think the value is going to go negative? So if I say like 7 p.m. or something like that? Ah, okay, so it looks like it does break because what's going to happen here is, you know, given the vectors, okay, something's not going to work. So, very it's good. To, it's just trying to change the extension to negative. Okay. So, because the value up there would be negative 7,000, and no one likes a negative 7,000 as a height or as a length. Okay. So, let's bring it back to sort of more 4.30 in the afternoon. Okay. Now the length is around 2. Okay. It's a little bit better. Actually, even what we're doing, we're sort of playing with it as though the sun is in a relatively constant position at noon. So if we really wanted to be good about, we'd have to sort of do the x, y, and z and kind of figure out you know, how it's coming from an oblique angle as opposed to coming directly on. So I'll put that back to noon. More or less. Okay. Now, in terms of thinking about this whole issue of like, is it too long? And really what the maximum value you might want to have in there could be, okay. The idea is we wanted to go through and set up some sort of maximum shade depth and say that, hey, basically if you're less than that, everything's cool, we're just gonna pass that through. But if it is greater than the shade depth, we have to break you into two shades. So that's what this maximum shade depth is. And the idea here is we're gonna take that shade depth and compare. Are you greater than that shade depth? That's really a true or false value. So two is less than five, so that's gonna be false. It won't be greater. If it was like A, it'd be greater, it'd be true. But what we're gonna do is go through and compute an alternate version of it. Okay, we're gonna go through and say that the shade depth, okay, is either gonna be what we've already calculated or we'll have an alternate version with the shade depth divided by two if we broke it into two. We're also going to change the height, at which point the shade height is going to be divided by 2. Okay, so we're going to take the glazing height and divide it by 2 because we put a shade halfway up the window. Okay, so how that works is as follows. We're going to go ahead and say the shade overhang needed, okay, this is actually what's necessary. Okay, the maximum shade depth is the five. So that's going to give us the true or false. The glazing height, let's just go ahead and pull that in. That's the same glazing height that we used over here. So I got my glazing height. Let's see if I can pull it over. So let's see what's going on. In this case, yeah. Is the shade overhang needed greater than the shade depth? And 6.85, so yes, it is greater, it's true. So in that case, we're going to say shade overhang needed divided by 2. I'll take the 6.8, make it 3.4. In terms of the glazing height, I'm going to take the 10, or whatever I have the glazing height set up to be, like 11 right now, and divide it by 2, it's going to be 5.6. Okay? So that's really just an alternate set of values. And we're actually in pretty good shape now.
So what I have is one of two different things. I either have sort of use this value or use this set of values. And what I need is basically an if condition that's going to go through and like a say how to handle that. So for the if condition, the if condition is always we're going to feed it some sort of test, a true or false test. That's going to be right here. And then what to pass through true, what to pass through a false. And the easiest way to probably get that is to actually just open up 2C, because I have the node out there set up for you. 3A, excuse me. And let's take a look. So again, I'll run this. I have it's true. I have the value 3.4. I have the value 5.6. So what we want to do is basically set up some little ifs. And the ifs are going to be as follows. So based upon whether two or one shades are needed, perhaps the appropriate depth, and also perhaps the appropriate height. The test is going to be overhang is greater than maximum shade depth. So that's going to be passed as either true or false. In this case, it's true. Okay. If it's true, if it's greater than what I'm going to pass through as the shade depth is I'm going to go through and pass the uh, shade depth divided by 2. So shade overhang needed divided by 2. Okay. If false, what I'm going to pass through is the original shade depth. So again, if it's true, we're going to go ahead and grab this. If it's false, we're just going to go ahead and grab that. For the height, if it is true, we're going to go through and put a second shade at glazing divided by 2. If it's false, I'm going to put the second shade at 0, which is basically going to turn it off. There's not going to be a second shade. So what this should do is, based on whether it's true or false, I'll always go through. And let's put some watches in here just so we sort of see. that. So since it is true right now, I'm getting the 3.4, I'm getting the 5.6, it's pulling in the true side. If I would change it though so it was false, and how can I change it so it's false? One thing I could do is I could say that the maximum shade depth is going to be allowable to be greater. So now it'll be the false side. So what's going to happen is it's going to pass through the true depth, the full depth, and zero as the height of the second one, just so that uh, it doesn't put a second one in there. Great. So now that you have these, you basically can go through and say, let's go ahead and take that result. That's the value here. Take that result. That's the value here. In terms of the element, again, since they're instance parameter or type parameters, excuse me. What I need to do is just go back and grab the element itself. So it's way back here. I need to bring that value right here. Okay. So now I have something that'll hopefully be smart. Okay, since I allowed seven, it's gonna go ahead and allow that to be, yeah, all a single shade. Whereas if I cut down the allowance to four, you'll go through and break it into two shades. Okay, so. There's not much to this. It's really just sort of simple vector math in terms of what's going on. But if you're thinking about having you know, something on your structure where either something sticks out or shades or opens or closes, you can use stuff like this just in terms of trying to figure out just uh, if you're just trying to block the sun from coming in, if you're not sort of concerned about the actual value of the sun, this vector is actually doing you a pretty good.
It's an awesome go to and keep So let's pause there for a second. Give people a chance to catch up and see if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Pretty. Okay. Let us do this. Let's go ahead and break now. Five. Come on back and can in five. If you want to go grab a bagel. Are they still sitting there? Left? Probably. Go, go grab your bagels and come on back and uh, we'll meet you in five. And when you come on back, we're going to talk about the solar insulation node and how we actually go through and use that. Yes. Kind of a little bit of setup, but it does all the hard work for us. So. Yeah. We have our bagel goers. I can oh. see it now. 